Well hello everybody, it's been a while. Welcome back to Doctor Who, the classic series action figures a history. A series on the host productions completely dedicated to taking a look at every single Doctor Who classic series action figure and variant from the very beginning of the line right up until present day. Apologies to those of you that have been waiting for the next episode of this series for the past few months. Basically, long story short, when I first started this series back in September 2019, the original intention was for this series to be released whilst I was at university studying, because whilst I am at university, I don't have access to my Doctor Who action figure collection, and I felt like when I was at university, I was lacking in product reviews and general merchandise videos. Therefore, this series was basically a place filler for that and something of which that I've wanted to cover for quite a long time. However, due to the unprecedented circumstances of the COVID-19 pandemic, basically the academic year was cut short in March 2020, meaning that I came home for the summer. And I thought that it was pointless continuing the series as originally intended whilst I was at home, because at the end of the day, I had access to my collection and inevitably when I would then go back to university in September 2020, I will be stuck in a similar situation. Therefore, I decided to suspend the series and then bring it back as originally intended in September to then be released once again as I'm at university, this time round instead of being in second year, being in third year. So the series is back now and in fact on a more regular basis, this series will be uploaded every single fortnight, meaning that this series will be continuing with the exception of a break over Christmas right up until the very end in early 2021 series will in fact be 15 parts long, I can now confirm, well that's if they don't release any more classic series action figures in the meantime, and of course this series will be following the same format that it has done for the past few episodes, taking a look at each individual release in order and giving a brief rundown of the action figures. Therefore, if you haven't checked out the previous episodes as of yet, I definitely recommend doing so, as I've taken a look at lots of different releases so far, from general release as well as the beginning of the Forbidden Planet exclusive series. However, this time round for episode 5, we pick up from where we left off, taking a look at further releases from 2010, including the Claws of Axos collector set, the Eleven Doctors collector set, another classic series TARDIS exterior box, and of course the Comic Con releases of 2010 as well. So sit back, grab a cup of tea, and I hope you enjoy this journey through Doctor Who classic series action figure history. The summer of 2010 seen the release of one of the most exciting Doctor Who collector sets of probably all time. It is of course the Eleven Doctors set, featuring at the point of release every single incarnation of the Doctor, meaning that we finally got to add Paul McGann as the Eighth Doctor in his Doctor Who the Movie clothing to the collection. This set does of course also include some different variations of the classic series incarnations of the Doctor, already released as a part of the series. However, now in different colour schemes. Naturally, this set did also come packaged alongside the new series incarnations of the Doctor, including the 11th Doctor in regular Series 5 outfit, the 9th Doctor in burgundy shirt, and the 10th Doctor in trench coat and glasses. However, for this series, we're not interested in those. So taking a look at the different incarnations of the Doctor in order, starting off with the first Doctor as portrayed by William Hartnell. Of course the sculpt of this figure is exactly the same to the originally released SDCC version of the first Doctor, however this time round in his five Doctors outfit. There has been a few alterations to the paint taps in the face, now not being as prominent especially around the eyes to the original version, and the costume itself is pretty similar, however it does include some subtle differences. The waistcoat is now a much more vibrant white colour as opposed to the off cream, and the cravat is now a glossy black. The blazer pretty much remains the same. However, the most noticeable difference is in the trousers, where the checkered design has been removed entirely and it is just a pair of pillar grey trousers, along with black glossy shoes. The original plan for this figure, I do believe, was to in fact release Richard Herdnell as the first Doctor, however, this plan was of course dropped. The first Doctor does also come packaged with his walking stick, however it is made this time round of a much more flexible plastic, but still keeps the same swirled detailing. 
Second Doctor figure in this set is sporting the costume as seen throughout the 10th anniversary special, The Three Doctors. The likeness to the face once again remains superb using exactly the same sculpt, however much like the first Doctor the paint taps have now been changed slightly to include a slightly darker skin tone and the hair seems to be a little bit more of a glossy black colour. In a similar scenario to that of the first Doctor there has been some subtle changes on the costume, the jacket itself now seems to be once again a slightly more glossy black and the actual shirt itself is a much more brighter blue, with the buttons highlighted in a rather nice bright white. As for the bow tie, this is now a black colour with some white polka dots as opposed to a darker blue, and the handkerchief is now not a burgundy red, but a few slight gashes of an almost teal colour. As for the trousers, once again a similar situation to the first Doctor where they are a grey colour, however they do have a slight hint of a white checkered design. And much like the previous release, the second Doctor does come packaged with his flute. Moving swiftly on to the third Doctor, once again this uses a combination of the same sculpted parts as seen on the previous third Doctor releases, most notably the Sea Devils variation of third Doctor released alongside a Sea Devil figure. Once again, very much like the first and second Doctors, there has been a slight revision to the paint taps in the hair as well as the face overall. The skin tone does pretty much remain the same, however the actual hair itself does seem to be a much more prominent white colour with a grey wash added over the top. As for the actual costume itself, this has seen a major revision in paint taps, making it look completely different. The actual undershirt itself is the frilled and cravat design. This time round, as opposed to being a frilled white colour, the shirt is now much more of a mint green, and the cravat itself is a darker brown. As to the blazer underneath, this is now no longer a black colour, but this time round has been replaced by a very prominent green, to reflect that of the Third Doctor, as seen throughout the Carnival of Monsters. This even includes a slight detailing of the buttons, as painted a black highlight, along with the hints of the frills at the end of the shirts once again poking out in a mint green colour. For the overcloak, of course this is exactly the same sculpt to that of the Sea Devils version, however this time round it is not black but it is brown with a few additional details of a darker brown on the clasps along the side and the much more prominent red has now been replaced by a much more tanned colour of red on the cloak inner lining exposed around the side. As for the back of the cloak itself, one is a much more of just a standard brown colour with the divide at the back as per usual. A much welcome change to the original Forbidden Planet version is now that the cloak is made of a much more flexible PVC, making it much easier to remove, meaning that you can display this third doctor with or without the cloak, nicely exposing the green suit blazer underneath. As for the trousers, this includes the booted design, first seen on the Death to the Daleks version of Third Doctor, and once again the boots have been painted in a rather nice glossy black. As per usual, the Third Doctor does come packaged with his sonic screwdriver, which features the usual paint apps. The fourth Doctor of the set this time round is from The Seeds of Doom, the crinoid story, and in fact sees a slight revision to the sculpt. As you can see, we have a much more stern version of the fourth Doctor, this time round on this figure, looking in fact rather concerned or worried, and then of course we also have the hat on top. Now of course the previous releases are normally the hatted and grinning head, as opposed to the hatted and stern face. The paint apps on this, I must say, are a little bit unusual. The lips are painted an unusual purple colour, and and as for the eyes, as I say, he just looks a little bit worried. The hat itself has been painted in a rather unusual green colour, along with a darker green band at the very top. The costume itself, once again, we see a rather eye-catching change in design, in a very similar idea to that of the Pyramids of Mars for the Fourth Doctor. So we have the waistcoat from, in fact, that figure, including the pinkish version of the cravat, as opposed to the orange design. And once again, this still retains the same detailing on the waistcoat, including a very intricate checkered design, along with lighter grey paint taps on the buttons. For the coat itself, once again this follows a rather similar design to the Pyramids of Mars Doctor, however this time round the texture has been completely revised to look a little bit more like tweed. As you can see we have the buttons that have been nicely highlighted with a black highlight, however the entirety of the coat has this rather satisfying looking texture, making it almost look stippled in appearance. A few buttons are also included along the back as well as the sculpting of a few pockets, a few creases, as well as the stitching lines within the coat itself. At the back of the arms you have the inclusion of some elbow pads and the cuffs of the jacket have been painted in a lighter brown colour, much like the elbow pads themselves. Trousers have been painted in your regular grey colour and the shoes at the bottom are brown with the addition of white spats. As per usual, the fourth Doctor does also come packaged with his regular sonic screwdriver. Fifth Doctor is basically a direct re-release of the fifth Doctor as first seen with F1, including the same paint apps on the costume. 
However, this is in fact the fifth Doctor, as seen in the later half of season, he acquires his salary, meaning that for the first ever time, the salary sculpt is available to be purchased as a part of a regular UK set, as opposed to being in the exclusive Time Crash set that was heavily fought after by fans, as covered in the first part of this series. The fifth Doctor does come packaged with his Sonic screwdriver, the same regular sculpt to all the other classic Sonics, however this time round given the paint taps of the red emitter at the top and the golden banded section. Of course the fifth Doctor didn't keep his Sonic screwdriver for long as it is destroyed within the first season of his stories in The Visitation. Sixth Doctor does also use exactly the same sculpt to the first figure as used within Wave 1, however a few paint revisions have been applied. Firstly, the likeness on the face does feature a few different changes within the paint application, and the hair does also have a much more vibrant yellow colour added over the top. However, the most noticeable difference is within the costume itself, as believe it or not, this has become even more brighter and vibrant from the original version. The waistcoat itself is this time round from the Trava Time Lord story, Terror of the Vervoids and features a green, pink and purple waistcoat design along with multicoloured chains and then we also have the cravat in the very middle, this time around a yellow colour with a few dots on there as well. The cat badge has also been replaced this time round to be a little bit more detailed including a brown cat with white spots along with a few black highlights in there as well. The trousers and the shoes do pretty much remain exactly the same, however the coat itself as I say has been given a much more vibrant wash including the yellow at the sides being a little bit more brighter and the colours on the back also being a little bit sharper, recreating a really stunning figure and a really lovely addition to the collection. For the third time in 2010, here we have another 7th Doctor figure, this time round in the brown outfit once again as seen throughout the later half of his era and originally seen alongside the electronic TARDIS released earlier in the year. The costume itself does remain exactly the same, however the main attraction for this figure is of course the non-hatted, more solemn, serious head. Once again, much like the grinning version of the Seventh Doctor, this really nicely captures the personality of his incarnation in his much more darker times. I really love the subtle inclusion of some creases around his forehead and also the general likeness overall looking very much like Sylvester McCoy. I think the eyebrows and the eyes have been really sharply painted I also love the way the hair has been done as well. However, I have always thought that the sculpt for the hair is maybe a little bit too short. I think it just needs to be a little bit more puffy around the sides. And it would also might have been nice to maybe see a few more paint taps on this as well, as it just seems to be a solid black colour, as opposed to having a grey highlight, which that said, is in fact seen on later versions of the Seventh Doctor. And of course, finally, for the Eleven Doctors set, saving the very best to last, the main attraction of the event, it is of course Paul McGann as the Eighth Doctor released for the first ever time in action figure form and I can remember the excitement back in the day of finally having every single incarnation. However, there was a few complications within the outfit and a few people questioning if it was in fact accurate because within the story there is quite a lot of tricky lit scenes within the movie itself, therefore it is hard to decide what colour the actual outfit is. Starting in the very middle, we have the waistcoat that has been generally painted in a light grey colour, however has a really lovely design over the top, along with the inclusion of a silver chain. Over this we do of course have the Edwardian overcoat, which has been painted in a lighter green colour, with the detailing of these brown lapel sections, as well of course as the silver buttons. The overall colour of this is nice and I think is a cool representation, depending on what lighting you see the 8th Doctor's costume in, and overall it does look okay. Turning around to the back we do have a few further details of the stitching designs as well as a few details of the buttons as well. But my 8th Doctor coat does go oddly off to the side as you can see making it a little bit lopsided especially in the lower half. As for the trousers, these are just a light grey colour with a few creases on, and at the very bottom we get your glossy black shoes. Fifth Doctor does come packaged with his sonic screwdriver, which doesn't really have any pen taps on, it's just a standard silver. Likeness to Paul McGann is another part of the figure that did cause quite a lot of debate, and in my own opinion I think it does look like him. You do have some nice detailing around the eyes and the eyebrows, nicely sharply painted, along with the rather natural looking lips, however I think that the main issue lies maybe in the hair because this has been painted in just almost irregular blackish colour however within the actual movie this does tend to be a much more of a lighter brown colour. This is later kind of rectified on the later versions of 
of the Eighth Doctor released, such as the comic book version, there's kind of been a few variations of Paul McGann's hair shade over the years, but I think that generally you can still see who it is meant to be. It's not too bad at least, I think you can certainly get away with it being this colour, and I think that the sculpt is generally also quite nice, including lots of different curls in there, especially around the front, really nicely connecting to the face. So overall, an okay likeness, it may have been nice to see a few wrinkles in there around the eyes or something like that, but it still looks cool. And of course, one of the pluses of the Eleven Doctors set is that due to it being on general sale, available to be purchased from a number of different retailers, very much like a regular wave of classic series action figures, this set is in fact not really that hard to come by. I think you could probably be able to buy the whole set, including its box, or even without its box, for fairly cheap if you are wanting to see every single incarnation of the Doctor up till Matt Smith within your collection. The later released Thirteen Doctors set is a lot harder to come by, features a few more interesting variations, and I think that that does in fact go for quite a lot on eBay. So yeah, I would certainly recommend trying to track down the Eleven Doctors set if you haven't got it already. And of course, having an Eighth Doctor within your collection, especially within his movie clothing, is also a nice variant. Looking back, 2010 seemed to be a rather popular year for the 7th Doctor. After three McCoy figures released and the TARDIS exterior, here we have another 7th Doctor story in action figure form, this time variations of Cyberman from Silver Nemesis. Now at first glance these may look like regular Earthshock Cybermen, however they're in fact completely different. Of course most recently both of these figures were re-released as a part of the B&M 2019 exclusive series along with, surprise surprise, another 7th Doctor variant. Therefore, these figures are now a lot easier to come by compared to previous years, and I certainly recommend either trying to track down these originals or the most recent variant releases. For the most part, the sculpt does remain rather similar in the helmet section compared to the Earthshock Cyberman, just with a slight adjustment at the very top, including this now almost funneled piece of a little dot on the side, and the visor on the mouth is now a little bit less clear compared to the Earthshock version. The chest unit itself has seen also a revision, now of this clear panel section to reveal some circuitry underneath. Turning the figure around to the back, we now have a much bigger contraption that features a lot of wires. The Earthshock variation did of course only have two wires at the very top here, however the Silver Nemesis version also has the three tube lines coming around from the side, as well as this whole grating at the very back. And of course the main difference itself is that the boiler suit, although similar, is in fact a completely different design. However, the same standard idea, featuring lots of different dirty and weathered sections to really bring out the different creases within the material, and we even have the inclusion of these grated designs at the bottom of the legs, as well as at the top of the arms as well. Both of these Cybermen do come with guns, which I must admit, I've never really been a fan of this design. I think that the Earthshock and Attack version of Cyberman gun is just quite iconic, really, and eye-catching. And this one looks a little bit like one of those cheap Poundland or Nerf guns that you would normally get. I just think that it, it looks a little bit dull. I don't really have anything else to say about it. However, it's a nice recreation from what is seen within the story, even if I don't like the design that much. Leader Cyberman is exactly the same to the Trooper Cyberman in sculpt design, however the only difference is on the handlebars on the helmet, these are now painted black as opposed to your regular silver design. Both of these Cybermen are in fact a little bit more silver compared to the Earthshock Cyberman, however not as shiny as the actual Silver Nemesis Cybermen as seen within the episode that have very much a chrome appearance which cannot really be replicated in action figure form due to how chrome actually flakes off plastic. Would have been nice to maybe see an Earthshock Cyber Leader released at some point, even if it is just the same sculpt as the Earthshock Trooper, however just with the handlebars painted black. It's a nice but useful variant. In a previous part of this series, of course I did already cover the Forbidden Planet exclusive 7th and 4th Doctor TARDIS exterior sets, however here we have the third and final release that is exclusive to Forbidden Planet from the classic series line. It is of course the 1st Doctor and TARDIS from the first ever Doctor Who story and an earthly child. Now also in a previous part of this series, I have already covered this version of the 1st Doctor along with the skull accessory and walking stick, which on this variant is is in fact exactly the same, so we don't need to take a look at that figure again. 
Now the sculpting of this first Doctor TARDIS, to put it completely bluntly, is entirely wrong. It looks nothing like the 1960s original TARDIS, and that is because the sculpt is not the original 1960s TARDIS, it is just the seventh Doctor stacked roof TARDIS repainted to look like the 60s prop. I must admit, I still really like it. I think it looks effective, you can tell what it's meant to be, and of course the colour scheme itself is drastically different from that original version. As I previously mentioned in the episode before, basically the classic series TARDISes use exactly the same bodies on every single release regardless of what type of TARDIS it is, just with the paint application to give the impression of the different type of TARDIS design from the different era it is meant to reflect. In the case of a 60s TARDIS, this is a little bit more prominent and obvious due to the fact that the 60s First Doctor TARDIS in particular is very different compared to the other TARDISes, having a much larger stacked roof that clearly is not present on on this figure. Something that we see quite a lot of on the B&M re-release TARDISes is the inclusion of weathering, and something of which that was lacking on the 7th and 4th Doctor TARDISes was indeed weathering, so this product is kind of a midpoint between the two, as we do have a little bit of ageing. As you can see around the bottom, we have this almost green smear dirt design, which looks very nice, and as to the actual TARDIS itself, the blue texture is not just a standard blue, but we do have a highlight added over the top of a lighter blue paint, which is very nice and appealing. As for the public call box sign, this has once again been rather nicely printed, it is very different from those original versions, this time round with a black font of text along with a white backdrop and of course not to mention the white border around the pull to open sign itself, certainly making it stand out. On the opposite side of this we do also have the inclusion of the St John's Ambulance sign along with the lock which has been painted a gold colour and of course the silver handle. Moving up to the windows, once again these have seen a major revision, this this time round having a bright white inner lining which really nicely emphasises the different window panes which is exactly the same sculpt. And then finally moving up to the very top we do of course have the stacked roof along with the police public car box signage. This time round the signage has been given a dark blue background and of course a slightly bluish grey text. To finish off, this TARDIS does also have the stacked roof as first seen on the 7th Doctor TARDIS release and on the most recently released 5th Doctor TARDIS as a part of the B&M exclusive line. Even though this set is technically completely inaccurate to what is seen on TV, I think it is still a nice addition to the collection to add alongside the other classic series exterior boxes. However, I think this was the moment within the classic series line of action figures where fans and collectors of the line were a little bit concerned as to how popular the line actually was. After all, we started out with quite a lot of general releases, and now at this point in 2010, we are starting to see fewer and fewer of those and more Forbidden Planet exclusive releases. Although there is still a lot of sets to come in the future, I think this is perhaps the first point within the, in the series of action figures where there was concerns that perhaps this line wouldn't include as much variety and brand new sculpts as we first hoped. The period of June and July of 2010 did of course once again see some San Diego Comic Con releases from the Doctor Who Classic series. The first of which is a single carded release of the fifth Doctor regenerated as seen throughout the last scene of Logopolis, the last fourth Doctor episode, and of course into the opening scenes of Castrovalva. There is something about the next incarnation of the Doctor in the previous incarnation's clothing that I really do enjoy. I think that this figure does have a nice novelty behind it, and plus I really do love this costume. It's one of my personal favourites of the fourth Doctor era, and of course having this sculpt within the collection does of course increase the likelihood of seeing a fourth Doctor within this costume at some point in the near future. Unlike the Sixth Doctor regenerated from Castrovalva that I covered in one of the earlier episodes of this series, the Fifth Doctor regenerated is a little bit more exciting because we actually see a brand new head sculpt. As you can see, Peter Davison's hair is much longer to the normal regular version as first seen with the Fifth Doctor in Wave 1. There is a lot of detailing on this, as you can see, stretching around to the side, a really lovely wash added over the top, really emphasising the different curls and details within the hair itself. Due to having the Fourth 
Dr. Scarf. Once you have removed this, it does of course have a little delve in the back, as you can see, to kind of fit the scarf section, making this sculpt a little bit unusable on any other figure than this one, which is a little bit of a shame, because you could partner this head with a regular Fifth Doctor body to kind of recreate a more accurate version of the Fifth Doctor, as seen throughout Season 19, or at least for to Doomsday, where he did have a little bit longer hair. Time round, he's got a little bit of a quiff going on, and the actual likeness to Peter Davison is pretty nice. With some rather sharp pain taps around the facial expression of the lips as well as the eyes, it does look rather impressive. As for the costume itself, as I mentioned earlier, I absolutely love this design. So for this part of the video, I'm just going to slide off the scarf to give a better look at the costume that does of course belong more primarily to the fourth Doctor in season 18. A really lovely burgundy colour. We do also have the highlights of the buttons around the side and the baggy shirt, which is lacking the question marks, which is a little bit of a shame. And then of course we do also have the trench coat overhang there at the back as well. Now due to this being the regeneration version of the fifth Doctor, a really lovely touch is this massive smear mark on the back to kind of represent the grass stain of where the fourth doctor fell within Legopolis, something of which that is not present on the season 18 figure of the fourth doctor. Towards the very bottom we do have once again burgundy trousers that have been rather nicely used, a rather baggy design, and then we have the boots there at the very bottom as well, rather nicely detailed in a brown paint with a little bit of darker coloured glossing. As to the scarf itself, of course this is one solid piece and does feature some rather nice colours, including burgundy and purple, and generally represents the costume pretty well, even including some tassels at the bottom. The second release of San Diego Comic Con is another Fifth Doctor dedicated set, this time with another variation of the Fifth Doctor with his Panama hat, alongside, more excitingly, a figure of Anthony Ainley as the Master. However, it is technically Chameleon posing as the Master, as both seen within The Planet of Fire, one of the last episodes from the Fifth Doctor era. Now, this set is in fact once again highly fought after by fans due to Anthony Ainley at the current time of film only ever being released once, and that is of course within this set. I mean, if you do get the opportunity to pick up this set for a reasonable price, I highly recommend it. Also, you get the opportunity to add another incarnation of the Master to your collection. Now we've seen the Fifth Doctor figure on many occasions already throughout this series, and to be honest, this figure doesn't really offer too much else other than the brand new head sculpt. The costume is exactly the same to those other releases, using exactly the same colour palette, and the trousers at the very bottom are the same as the original Wave 1 release. As also seen within the Eleven Doctors set, the Fifth Doctor now has his celery sculpt reinstated, which is nice to see, and really completes the look. And then, of course, the main selling point of the figure itself is the adjusted head sculpt. Now, I think that this is pretty much just a retool, because the actual likeness is pretty much the same from what I can see to a regular Fifth Doctor figure released on a few occasions before, and it has, of course, just had the Panama hat stuck on top. So, once again, a few sharp paint taps on this, along with the detailing of the hair at the very side sticking out of the hat, and the hat itself is pretty basic, really. We just have the white design, a very similar colour to that of the jacket itself, and we even have the inclusion of the band running around the side, and nothing really too much else. At the very top, we do also have the inclusion of this dipped design with a few dirt smears on there, which is quite nice, it gives the figure some texture, and other than that, there's nothing really too much else to say. This Fifth Doctor hatted sculpt was also seen within the Toys R Us 50th anniversary set, including a Dalek from Resurrection of the Daleks, and I do believe the paint application is quite similar, if not identical. I can't in fact compare due to that being a set that I do not have. Pew evil music and stereotypical 80s sound effects, it is of course Anthony Ainley as the master. Now it is a shame that character options decided to go with a rather bland variation of Anthony Ainley for the only ever figure release that we've seen of this incarnation of the master. I'd have much preferred them to go with the more frilled shirt version of Anthony Ainley that was seen in episodes such as Survival. And I do believe that a few people have in fact used customizations of the Roger Delgado body and stuff the Anthony Ainley head on top, which is quite a clever idea to be honest. This time round, 
Anthony Anley has rather unusually used a body of a pre-existing character options action figure from new series Doctor Who. And even more funnily enough, that figure is of course the John Sim Master from Series 3, which is very, very unusual. Of course, the Master does like to wear suits, so it only makes sense. So unfortunately, character options are kind of going through a little bit of a cheap route with this set really, but it does do the job to represent Anthony Anley as seen, or at least Chameleon as seen seen within the Planet of Fire. However, something to note is that there is a slight retool that has taken place, which is basically what looks like a waistcoat underneath the actual suit itself, which isn't present on the Series 3 Prime Minister John Sim Master figure. King, a look at the likeness of Anthony Ainley, I think that character options did a decent job. It certainly looks like Anthony Ainley, and they've definitely got the shape of his face right, and of course, definitely his hair is almost perfection. We have the moustache and sort of the beard coming around the side, and some really lovely details on the facial expression as well. In particular, I love the way the eyebrows have been painted once again, and the eyes, they're not really that off or anything like that, unlike, say, some of the fourth Doctor figures, you have one eye looking one way, and the other in an opposite direction making it look like he's got a lazy eye, which would be something that would be detrimental to an Anthony Ainley figure, considering that both he and Delgado have a very prominent and evil-looking stare, which is definitely captured within this figure. Taking a look at the sides, we do have a really lovely swept-back hair look with a few details on there. However, for the most part, it's just been painted a standard brown colour. Once again, the side profile is really impressive, actually, and I only imagine that there must be a reason behind the scenes that we've not seen another Delgado figure released. I've heard rumours that there's something to do with licensing from the Anthony Ainley estate or something like that, leading to no other re-releases that have occurred, because I think we would have seen certainly some more variants by this point. Hopefully that will be sorted someday, because it will be lovely to have more representation of Anthony Ainley within the figure format in the years to come. And that does of course conclude the San Diego Comic Con limited edition Forbidden Planet exclusive releases of 2010. Overall, a nice selection of figures and it is nice to see the Fifth Doctor getting further representation. And continuing on the same path after the release of the SDCC Planet of Fire set, we have another classic series, Incarnation of the Master, this time round the first TV appearance of the Master, of course Roger Delgado, one of the best Masters of all time, alongside the Axon creature, as seen throughout the third Doctor story, The Claws of Axos. Character options once again seem to be going through one of those phases where the likenesses of their characters are absolutely spot on. Roger Delgado, in a rather similar light to Anthony Ainley, they've got the stare incredibly correct. It looks very evil, and you could almost imagine him looking down the camera and saying, I am the master, and you will obey me, and all of those things that you did, of course, also say throughout the third Doctor era. The facial hair has also been really nicely painted. As you can see, we have these highlights around the sides of the beard where there will be a little bit of a grey smear almost within the show itself and likewise for the actual hair there is a little bit of a grey wash that has been added over the top of this to really nicely accentuate some of those curls and the strands of hair as well really bringing out the detail. Of course Delgado in the actual series does have a rather tanned skin colour and this has also been really nicely coloured on the figure itself doesn't look too over the top or anything like that and it does certainly look like Delgado and you can definitely tell what incarnation of the master it is meant to be. As for the costume that Delgado is wearing, there really isn't that much to talk about. It's just black with a few stitching lines here and there, a few pockets at the side. He's also wearing gloves, and of course, you guessed it, some black trousers at the bottom as well, followed by some black shoes. He really does like black, doesn't he, to probably represent the evil side that his character has. The Master does also come packaged with his TCE, also known as Tissue Compressor Eliminator, which is just a little bit of black plastic with a few silver highlights on there, and does look a little bit like a lipstick, just saying. And of course, now that we have Delgado and Ainley together, we have the two humanoid incarnations of the Master, as seen throughout the classic series, to also accompany the decayed Master from the Deadly Assassin, as released as a part of the Wave 2 series. 
Now, as I mentioned in one of the earlier parts of this series, where I covered the Wave 2 of Classic Series action figures, I briefly mentioned that that wave was meant to include a collect and build figure, and it was the crinoid, as seen throughout the fourth Doctor story, the Seeds of Doom. Of course, a few years later, after the release of Wave 2, the crinoid was then released as a part of the Forbidden Planet exclusive line. However, the sculpt was also used for this figure of the Axon creature. Now, this does lead to a few inaccuracies. It does look a little bit unusual and not really like the axons as seen throughout the story. However, you get the impression of what it is meant to be and it certainly does a very good job. To start off with, it does have a little bit of a facial expression which these figures are not meant to have from what I understand. However, one of the benefits of having a figure with 360 head articulation is that you can turn it round to have these little veins coming down the sides of the face and now a completely emotionless face with no expression on at all, which are arguably looks a little bit more like the axons as seen throughout the third Doctor adventure. To the size as well, this figure is unusually a little bit more weighty than your regular 5.5 action figure. It looks great alongside the other figures. Briefly talking about the figure, because I'm not going to go through every last bit of detail, but it does have some rather nice and very ugly and gruesome looking textures on here, including a few veins going down the side, and a few other different bits of red detailing. I think the paint apps themselves really nicely bring out the different details, including different pinks, different reds, and even some purples on there as well. It's looking like a battered internal organ or something like that. And then of course the face, or what is not really a face at all, just the continuation of this almost cellular design is also very nice consisting of the same amount of detail. The same is present on the arms which does have a few claw things here and there as you can see and then of course on the very back we have a continuation once again of what would be the roots as seen on the crinoid figure but for the purposes of the axon they're just other bits of material flailing off the body. So yeah, it's a rather nice design and a cool creature to add to the third Doctor collection. Out of all the Forbidden Planet exclusive collector sets, I think that the Claws of Axos one is probably one of the more common sets that have been released. Therefore, if you are interested by this product, you could probably find it for a fairly decent price. And if you're just interested in a Roger Delgado figure, then that figure has of course been re-released on a number of different occasions, including a B&M re-release set alongside a Third Doctor and Joe Grant figure a few years ago. And with that, that does bring to a close the fifth episode of Doctor Who, the classic series action figures, a history. I hope you have enjoyed it. This episode has continued to take a look at the releases from back in 2010. This episode has in fact been rather Doctor focused, taking a look at lots of different variants, along with the third variant of TARDIS exterior box, and of course, most excitingly, the debut of two incarnations of the Master, with Roger Delgado and Anthony Ainley. In fact, in the case of Anthony Ainley, the one and only figure that he has seen within the series so far. So thank you very much for watching this video, I hope you have enjoyed it. Do of course stay tuned for the sixth episode of the series as I continue my look at the 2010 releases, this time round from the winter months, taking a look at further variants of Cybermen, this time round from the sixth Doctor story, Attack of the Cybermen and Revenge of the Cybermen, along with the debut of another Doctor Who companion within the line being Perry alongside Syl from Vengeance on Varos. This episode has continued to showcase some of the best variety within the classic series action figure line, with 2010 definitely being one of the most popular years for the series so far. Do of course join me next time in the series as I will be taking a look at more classic series action figures and of course some traditional variants in there as well. Do also stay tuned on the host productions for brand new Doctor Who content each and every week and of course until then I shall see you all next time. Bye for now.